Hi, I'm Richard Kingsmill. If you look back over the history of popular music, there are a few key acts along the way that really revolutionised the times. In the 50s, it was Elvis Presley. In the 60s, the Beatles. The 70s, it was the punk of the Sex Pistols. And then in the 80s, people like Michael Jackson and Madonna were the ones that everyone looked at. In the 90s, it was a band called Nirvana. And they changed the world, not with the first album, but with their second. Few, if any, albums from the last 20 years can lay claim to the generation-spanning, genre-defining and industry-redefining legacy that Nirvana's Nevermind boasts. In May 1991, a group of misfits from Aberdeen, a small town not far from Seattle, started recording their second album. Kurt Cobain and Chris Novoselic had only achieved minimal success with their debut, called Bleach, in 1989. Now, with new drummer Dave Grohl on board, record company expectations in the follow-up were still only modest. The aim was to try and sell a quarter of a million copies across the next year. The people who like their first album would like this one also. Of course we want to make a comfortable living at it to at least be able to eat, you know, and travel on tour. But as far as like getting in the top ten, we don't care at all. We know it won't happen, you know. While Bleach was famously recorded for just over $600, Nirvana's label coughed up $65,000 for Nevermind. They also drafted in producer Butch Vig to help the band achieve their vision of a heavy sound with the same punk rock ethic of their debut. The final mixes were done by Andy Wallace, who had just finished work with Slayer. The album's lead single, Smells Like Teen Spirit, came out two weeks before Nevermind. It wasn't meant to be the big hit. Come As You Are was the one that the record company thought would have the best chance of crossing over. But buoyed by significant airplay of the now iconic music video, Teen Spirit struck a chord globally. With its unmistakable opening riff and explosive chorus, it became an unknowing anthem for a generation of disaffected youth. And Nirvana's adopted home city of Seattle became the epicentre of the music world. Following the release of Nevermind in September 1991, the demand for the album started to quickly spread outside the band's fan base in Northwest America. Nirvana smells like Team Spirit. Nirvana. It debuted at 144 on the Billboard charts, but the next few months saw the album's sales grow and grow. In January 92, the album eventually hit number one in the States, dethroning the king of pop, Michael Jackson. Nevermind was top five and selling platinum all around the globe including in Australia, where it peaked at number two. At this time, right at the height of their popularity, the band honoured a commitment to tour Australia, which they had made before the release of Nevermind. They played the very first Big Day Out in Sydney in January 92, and they also did their own shows in medium-sized venues in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Canberra and Adelaide. Before the Nirvana phenomenon, there had been a very clear division between the alternative and mainstream worlds. The widespread acceptance of Nevermind changed this forever. Other Seattle bands also succeeded in breaking down this divide and achieved huge success. Acts like Pearl Jam, Soundgarden and Alice in Chains were suddenly catapulted into arenas. Such an explosive movement of new music needed a label and the word grunge was coined for all these new guitar bands. I mean, we get per diem, I guess. Rich, Richard, Dick is short for Richard. Yeah. So if you're rich, you're a dick. Who's number one? The lyrics are secondary. You know, my Sharona, what the hell is my Sharona? <laughs> you know? But it changed my life. It did. <laughs> While it was far from their intention, Nirvana and Kurt in particular became the poster children for grunge. Cobain expressed frustration that his lyrics were widely misinterpreted, 
and he felt the burden of being anointed as the spokesperson for a generation. We were the chosen rejects. We, we chose not to be yeah. part of the popular crowd. I mean, I, I can remember um, a lot of times the more popular people, the jock type of people who were into sports and um, staying clean and brushing their teeth all the time and doing what their parents were you know, asking them to do. Um, they always asked me if I wanted to join their little clubs and I decided not to. Uneasy with fame and troubled by the loss of anonymity, he and the band spiralled into uncertainty. The band's third album, In Utero, was released in 93, with the direct aim of divorcing itself from the perceived commercial sound of its predecessor. But with such a meteoric rise to popularity, Nirvana always seemed destined for a tragic ending rather than to merely just fade away. And early in April 1994, the world was confronted with the news of Kurt Cobain's death. The 250,000 sales the label hoped for has now reached 30 million and counting. And the strong influence Nirvana has had on Australian audiences has been well documented in Triple J's Hottest 100s. In 2009, the station's Hottest 100 songs of all time saw Smells Like Teen Spirit voted in clearly as the number one song. Exactly 20 years after its release, we now celebrate the enormous impact we all felt with the release of Nirvana's Nevermind. I got to see Nirvana twice on that Australian tour, and at both shows, everyone in the room knew it was history in the making. We all knew that this band was incredibly special. You had a lead singer who could sing at one moment and then almost tear your head off with that enormous scream. The rhythm section just pounded in your chest for the entire performance. It was also incredibly dangerous. You felt along the way that it could all fall apart at any given moment. And I guess at that point, we all realised that Nirvana may not be a band that would be around forever. What you're about to see is incredibly special. This is the band on stage in their hometown of Seattle. It's exactly a month after the release of Nevermind. The album was getting rave reviews and it was starting to sell through the roof. As far as we know it, this is the only concert of Nirvana's to be shot on film. It's going to look great and sound great. The band is at the peak of their power. You are amongst the first audiences anywhere in the world to see this concert. So enjoy it, scream if you like, clap certainly, just don't do any crowd surfing and you'll dig this a lot. This is Nirvana live at the Paramount. <laughs>